This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. I'll call you right back. Yes. The number that you, that on, uh, that Aloha. Here. I'm Marcia Joyner, and these are the ties that bind. Today, we are going to talk to Jake Oliver, who is the publisher emeritus and former chairman of the board for the Afro-American newspapers, and he is in Baltimore. And it is a 125-year legacy. And so we are going to talk about just that, a 125-year legacy. So, Jake, are you there? There yep, he is. I'm here. Oh, how handsome you are. <laughs> you flatter me. <laughs> oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm biased. That just mm -hmm. so that the audience knows that this beautiful man is my cousin. We share a set of grandparents, great-grandparents, and great-great-grandparents. And so to talk about the legacy, this 125-year-old newspaper, which has chronicled the lives of black people in America for that long. So in sharing and ties that bind, I thought it was necessary to set the stage of all of that we have been through as a people, as black people in America, that this was the best place to start. Jake, so tell us yep. all about the Afro. <laughs> Well, that's, uh, I'm not sure we have enough time, 125 years. 125 is, uh, years. Yes, it, it, it covers a lot of things. Uh, uh, when I think about the uh, historical uh, span of time that uh, this institution has, has uh, more or less uh, been serving uh, its community and minority communities in general in, in this country, um, I generally break, break it up. Uh, into decades, um, and that really comes from me having at least the opportunity over the last 31 plus years to you know, really get involved in uh, what we call the archives, the old editions that uh, over the last 15, 20 years we were able to uh, organize, uh, started an indexing, and probably uh, among the most proudest accomplishments has been uh, the digitization of the old editions, most of the old editions, which have uh, permitted uh, many people on the Internet to, to access uh, and research uh, the historical events that the Afro has, has been reporting about over the last 125 years. Um, but during the, the, that 125-year period, uh, it, it really is interesting to see, just like anything, it grows, it changes, it evolves. Um, and uh, some of the uh, things are, are, are quite astounding and others are not. Um, there is always one consistent uh, flow throughout the entire period. As we've always uh, recognized the need uh, for, a, uh, for us to have a, a strong and a very prominent voice uh, uh, on uh, issues relating to uh, promoting progress for minority communities across the country, um, and that's modern-day civil rights. Mm -hmm. um, but back in uh, the turn of the 20th century, um, uh, it, it was uh, not healthy uh, to be too loud, and we did not really have that big of a voice. Um, but over the first uh, decade, we could, uh, as a result of reporting on events, uh, we could really begin to see how the black community was becoming aware of of how it did have rights that uh, it needed to become a lot more vocal in protecting and progressing. Um, and I, I guess some of the early uh, events that um, is in present day, and you, when you look back, uh, Marcia, uh, uh, some of those events that we reported um, in the first 
decade of the 20th century, 1902 and, and through 19, probably 12, um, uh, they're rather shocking. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, one of the uh, more interesting uh, articles appeared in, in 1906, January edition, front page <clears> of <throat> the Afro. that talked about uh, the fact that over the past year, um, there have been 73 lynchings. Uh, most of the lynchings occurred in the South. And of the 73 lynchings, uh, 69 of those lynchings were of black men. Uh, three were white men, and one was a black woman. Uh, but the article, which was very interesting, which really caught my attention, uh, went into a level of specificity as to not only the number and the states, but also the months, and also categorized and indexed uh, uh, the alleged violations that uh, apparently gave sort of uh, a way to uh, the unfortunate conclusion of the lynchings. Um, and uh, you really get a sense that the writer of that article, um, even though they were being very polite, uh, they were very out, they were outraged. Uh, he or she was outraged uh, by the intensity and, and the uh, numbers of of atrocities that were occurring, primarily through the South, Mississippi, yes. Georgia, et cetera. My and then it got to the point of where there was one uh, uh, describing what these people were alleged to have done. Um, and then it says, of course, and then it gets to the poor, uh, the poor fellow in Louisiana who got lynched because he was alleged to have stolen one dollar. Well, you know, um, my mother, your aunt, uh, said while she was mm -hmm. at Fisk University, for, which is in Tennessee, that there was a lynching every weekend just outside of town. Mm. Every weekend. That's, and that yeah, was that's, in the, what, 30s? 1930s? That's in the 30s, yeah. 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 I have the lynchings uh, uh, really reached their peak uh, around, right after World War I, uh, between 1920, 1919, and 1927, uh, that it, it, they just, uh, and, and it was also uh, precipitated by and large, unfortunately, by the return of black troops uh, from Europe who were in, um, you know, in uniform. And mm -hmm. uh, they posed a threat uh, to uh, many of the southern uh, communities uh, and resulted in these young men just getting killed. Oh, yeah. That uh, but, it, it was, <laughs> but, but that was just reflective of just, you know, again, jumping back to the first decade. Uh, there was an article uh, in 1907, I believe, uh, that talked about the fact that uh, all of the uh, black troops in, in, in the U.S. Army were sent out of the country. Uh, and that was primarily uh, the, rational, the rationale for that was uh, that uh, black men in uniforms, particularly in the South, posed a threat to white communities. They just were very, very concerned. And there was, uh, uh, there had been riots and, and abuses, but, you know, to, to the extent that there were, at after that decision by the Secretary of War, which was supported uh, by President Teddy Roosevelt, there were no longer any black soldiers in the country uh, until probably 1909, 1910. Uh, and primarily as a result of, of uh, the newspaper, the Afro and, and the black community, beginning to find its voice in objecting uh, to uh, uh, the abuse of this magnitude. Well, you know, um, and that, that, go ahead. Uh, but that sort of leads into the, the, the second decade where uh, the voice became organized um, and uh, it, you know, it was very interesting that uh, we were tricked into organizing it because um, we thought that we were going to have a, a, a stronger voice 
to promote black opportunities uh, coming out of the 1912 presidential campaign uh, because uh, for the first time, the black community was approached as a black community. Its vote was approached, uh, but most importantly, by the Democratic Party. Um, and its candidate in 1912 was Woodrow Wilson. And Woodrow Wilson made lots of promises, and he sent uh, black AME bishops into the black community to try and convince, and indeed did convince, uh, the Afro and and majority of the black community to support this, you know, very quiet, uh, uh, intellectual past president of Princeton University and uh, uh, to support him as president. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, six months after uh, we had been instrumental in electing him, we realized that we had made a big mistake because he, in he essence... didn't turn out uh, that way. <laughs> So he got rid of every black person who had any meaningful position in the federal government and never hired any black people at all, except for one person as a ambassador to uh, uh, two countries in uh, in um, Africa. And Other that, that no yeah, black no, your grandfather, your grandfather. Yeah. Do we have a picture of? Uh, we do. It should be number three, number three. This one, right here. That is Dr. Jacob B. Oliver, which is our grandfather, and he was one of those nominated by Woodrow Wilson to... Uh, Become an uh, ambassador to Trinidad, I think. Um, I thought it was... But he rejected it. Yeah, he rejected it. And that... It could have been either Liberia or Trinidad. Liberia, sure, it was Liberia, yeah. And mm -hmm. the other one in the picture is our grandmother, Rose mm -hmm. Oliver, Rose Murphy Oliver. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's Rose Murphy, and this is Dr. Jacob B. Oliver. Those are our grandparents. And mm -hmm. so while we've got the pictures up, let's go back to number one. Can we go back? This, this is uh, George Enoch Howard, who was our, what, great-great-grandfather, something like that. And uh, mm -hmm. he was the largest landowner in the state of Maryland, Montgomery and Howard Counties. Uh, well, Howard County, that I'm told, is named after him. Howard County. And mm -hmm. so that his daughter, uh, Martha, his daughter Martha married uh, John H. Murphy, John Senior. H. Murphy Sr. and the person who really was instrumental who, in getting yes. the So, nice. if we can yeah. go to the next picture, the this one, okay. John H. Murphy is the one holding the baby. This picture was done in 1900, and so it was Martha, the daughter of the rich landowner, and of course, uh, John H. Murphy was, came back from the Civil War, stumbles into a rich landowner that had daughters, he marries Martha, and thus all of those other people, and one in the background, Rose, is our grandmother. So that's how we're moving fast through, through uh, generations. But mm -hmm. it was John H. Murphy, who needed to support all this family that he had, that was the story is he borrowed two hundred dollars from his wife. Two hundred dollars at the turn of the century was a lot of money, yeah. and thus was... began the Afro. So, Jake, thus we begin. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was really in partnership with several of the uh, existing uh, black churches in Baltimore, uh, because uh, it, it was two of the pe preachers' uh, partners um, had really started uh, a p black publication um, and hired John H. Murphy Sr., uh, who, after two or three or four years, uh, turned around and bought the paper from them. 
Um, and at that point, uh, uh, things started to really started to change. It, they it started to focus more on uh, developing a, a voice uh, for promoting progress in the black community. Whereas when it was initially started, it was really a, a, like a, a, a Sunday school publication, wow. uh, a religious publication. Um, but it's also interesting, Marsha, to, to compare, you know, the decades, as I said, um, with the types of articles uh, that appear. Because back in the first decade, it was very rare that you're going to have any articles reporting crime, because I'm not sure what crimes existed. <laughs> uh, in the black community at that time. I mean, it, it, I, I, re, I remember running across an article from 1904 uh, recently that was talked about in Frostburg, Maryland. There were four, there had been four robberies. Um, and that was front page. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, but it was very clear. It says that, but those robberies were all committed by white people. Uh, and, and it was like, you know, it's like reading that from the perspective of the day, uh, that, 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 you know, <laughs> why was that therefore put in the front page? Well, Apparently because of the fact that crime wasn't a big deal. I, I, as, back a, then. as a child, I remember walking everywhere and no one mentioned crime. Listen, Jake, we need to take a break and we'll be back in okay. one minute. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. They said I could play, so any chance to play at all. You know, that's my life. I love music. Yeah, I saw it. Hello, I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and this is The Ties That Bind. And today we are talking to Jake Oliver. And we are talking about 125 years of the Afro-American newspapers and all of the issues or has it as it has chronicled our struggles in America. And the one that that jumps out to me uh, simply because I was a child at the time and the word sedition was a big word. I had no idea what it meant. And still it seems strange. During World War Two, the, all of the black newspapers chronicled all of the troops that were fighting in Europe for somebody else's independence. And yet they came home to rank segregation. It was just awful. Everywhere. We talk about the South, but it was everywhere. And so all of the papers wrote of article after article after article, and, and Jake will tell you more about all of the articles, all of the black newspapers supporting the troops. And at some point, the federal government charged all of the black newspapers with sedition, which means the giving aid and comfort to the enemy, because they were telling the truth. But it said it was, we were tending uh, towards insurrection. Yes. Uh, and um, uh, they were, uh, my recollection uh, on this is, I wasn't born then, but the point <laughs> is, is that um, this was a, a, a time during which 
the National Newspaper Publishers Association, uh, which is the Black Press Association, uh, really began to galvanize its voice uh, because of the fact that all its black newspaper across the country were really reporting about the same thing, highlighting uh, the injustices uh, that were focused on black troops. Now, this is not something that just suddenly appeared in the Second World War because uh, it, it really uh, became very apparent in the First World War, uh, so much so with the black troops uh, in Europe. Um, uh, France, there was a front-page article in the 1918 edition of the Afro that talked about the French government rose up and registered a formal objection to the way black troops were being mishandled by the white officers. Um, and uh, that the entire country was offended by the, the, by the, by the poor treatment uh, of the black soldiers. Uh, but when you get to the Second World War, uh, it became even more prominent. Um, and um, it, it, it was so much so that uh, because of the fact that at that point in time, the black press had a better organized uh, sense of itself, uh, we began to make an, an impact. And I, I've got the impression that it did have an impact uh, on President Roosevelt um, and also, thank God, Eleanor, his wife, was very helpful. Uh, but it also uh, really resulted uh, in uh, Vice President Truman, uh, after Roosevelt's death, who became president, one of the first things he did was to pass an executive order uh, that integrated the troops uh, because of the fact that um, he felt that segregation was, was an atrocity, uh, particularly uh, you sending all these troops across uh, uh, the oceans uh, and, and for purposes of fighting uh, to liberate and promote democracy. But when they come home, uh, they have everything but anything but justice. Um, uh, and he felt that segregation promoted this in, in continuation of the, in, the injustice uh, that, that was very prominent, particularly when these troops were uh, arriving back from Europe uh, and from the Pacific. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's sedition. So, but they, but the, the concern initially arose as a result of the organized voice raised by the black press uh, in the early 40s that caught the attention of, of various uh, politicians um, and eventually got uh, President Roosevelt a lot more sensitive to it than what he otherwise probably would have. Well, uh, again, thanks to, so to Eleanor. It, it Eleanor, yes. Uh, you know, we are talking, anybody that tuned in late, we are talking about the Afro-American newspapers and its 125-year history, which chronicles our history uh, most of our history in the United States, the good and the bad. Uh, there was a lot of good in the paper, lots and lots as you go through. We look at so many documents, documents, documentaries, documentaries of other people and they use the archives, the Afro archives. There's so many stories and we see it over, especially the war stories. We had a, a, a cousin who was a war correspondent. Which one of which one of was it Carlita? It was Betty. No, it was Betty. Betty. Betty Moss. Betty. Betty Phillips, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She was a war correspondent, but there was another one that was in uniform somewhere. We have pictures of her. I don't think mm -hmm. it was one of them. And they were war correspondents. And Lacey. He was a yeah, war Sam Lacey. Sam Lacey was a war uh, correspondent. Um, yeah, but yeah, 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 Art Carter. Who Art Carter. Just, uh, he, he, he moved in with Tuskegee Airmen in Italy. Mm -hmm. um, you had Ollie Stewart, who was one of the first uh, black war co correspondents uh, uh, in the war. In the Second World War, um, uh, the Afro during the Second World War, we had we we were sending black correspondents 
uh, all over the place um, and to cover Pacific theater as well as the European theater. Um, and uh, we had some very famous correspondence as a result of that. But it was Art Carter and Ali Stewart uh, that come to mind almost instantly as the ones who uh, really caught the, the flavor of the various parts of the war, from not only the coverage, our coverage of the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, but also uh, what it was like to be a black soldier walking down the Champs Elysees the, uh, the, the day uh, the American troops uh, liberated Paris. Uh, I mean, I mean, there were, were stories that were that were posted that really gave a clear sense of what the black involvement was, but also what the black experience was to be part of such a, an international event such as the World War II. Well, you know, so, I have such vivid memories of World War II, and I think it's because of the paper. As a little girl, um, your other co cousin Carl and I, Carl Edward and I, uh, because our fathers were in the war and our mothers were working at the Afro, we went to cover school that was close to the paper and then we would walk back to the Afro at the end of the day and then spend the rest of the day. So I thought everybody went to work because that's what we were doing. We were going to work. And <laughs> listening to you now, I realize the re that's the reason I am so familiar with the war because it was an everyday thing. The paper was every day, mm -hmm. it was every bit of the war, and I, it just occurred to me that that's why I'm so familiar with it and seen so much a part of it. It's because that's, mm -hmm. it was every day. It was there. Yeah. The paper was totally invested in the war. Yeah, I mean, it was, we're, again, we were trying to give people a picture of the involvement of the minorities and the contribution of minorities. And, and uh, Marcia, it, 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 I guess one of the most striking articles, front page articles that caught my attention was, was an article that appeared on the front page of the paper before we jumped into the war. It was in 1939. Um, and it, 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 the front page headline talked about the fact that how black troops were not going to be sent to Arizona to pick cotton. <laughs> and, and I just completely froze. Well, that's not no day work. Apparently, that's what they were going to do because there was a uh, there was a resistance. Uh, keeping in mind that there was uh, they, they, there was segregation uh, at that time, the troops weren't integrated. Um, uh, but uh, there were uh, black officers, mm -hmm. and uh, you know there was uh, a lot of the troops, particularly some of the southern troops really resisted uh, having to even give respect to a black officer who outranked them. Um, and so uh, uh, the question is, well, what do you do with these people? And they said, well, get them out of sight and out of the way. Uh, but luckily, uh, Roosevelt jumped in and, and killed it. Well, uh, but it was, I believe, Secretary of War Stimson was one who was uh, also uh, had considered it. But luckily, because of the pressure and the out outrage registered by the black press, uh, they backed off. Well, Jay, darling, mm -hmm. we have only gotten up to the 40s of a 125 year odyssey. So we are yeah, out well. of time. <laughs> Therefore, you will have to come back and we will have to okay. go from 1950 up to today. So Thank okay. you. But I, 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 I honestly, we always start in 1944 because there's an article uh, that where we interviewed um, uh, Albert Einstein at Princeton where he talked about the difference between what he experienced as a Jew in, in Germany versus what he could see blacks were being subjected to here in America. And that is something that is absolutely astounding. Oh, okay. So now <laughs> we know we know how a way to pick up on... Part two. Jake, thank you okay. so much. It's a pleasure it's spending a pleasure. this time with you. And we look yeah. forward to part two. Aloha. Okay.